Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And then I'm going to use this one. Okay. Um, so, so we can do that. Now we are a little bit darker. So, so yeah. our faces are a little bit darker, but you can see us up here. So, what would you prefer in the house? This is fine. Yeah. Okay. Say less. Yes. Uh, so, Mr. Stanley, yes. it's good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for being back here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to just introduce you all um, to this dear man. Uh, I, I get a word of introduction here, but would you like to introduce yourself a little bit more? Uh, I can. My name is Peter Stanley, and my TOS pie is a quote up. It is my way of life. I have been more of a flag into these people of living. I originally was baptized Catholic. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because through my journey, I don't realize how I'm willing to reach out and I don't ask for help. I don't know how many people are ever, ever in this situation. Okay. And the reason I say that is because on this morning I reached out, my godmother is still alive, and I reached out to her. And I asked her to pray for me this morning. She is, I realized she is the first person in my life I have ever asked to pray for me other than my mom. I just don't ask for your prayer. Do I accept? I love your prayers. <laughs> I love them. Okay. When people ask me, can I pray for you? I had a woman at work. I did not know. She introduced herself to me. And she asked if she could pray for me. And yes. Okay. So I appreciate them. I don't know how to ask very well. And I realized, I think I ask for help better than ever before. Okay. I believe that about myself in this lifetime. I just realized I don't. I'm not a real good at it now. And so I'm trying to relearn some things and realize that I need help as much as I can ever help anyone else. I need to be able to receive that help. And so I believe it's an exchange of things. You know what I mean? It's like when I pray for someone else, I think that I received something. So I should also appreciate other people praying for me because they will receive something through that also. If that makes sense. That's my belief. So, yeah, I um, today all of my practice for the most part is the both of and I also do some other. I, I work with some people from the Captain Mama Native American Church. So, some of that is through the group. Chief Freddie is from Peru, one of his priests. I'm very close to he's like a brother to me. I should meet with him, and then of course some punch and I'll be and pro and some other people around me. And I always try to go to what sometimes I refer to as the elders for me. Doesn't mean they're chronologically older than me. I can learn from all of them, and the elders don't necessarily need to be an age or a generation older than me for me to respect them as an elder. And for me, that's the greatest thing that I have to carry today is the fact that I can look at my grandson and realize I can learn as much from him as I can an elder that's been in my life for years. So that's a little bit about the way that I watch today. Thank you so much for that introduction. I love so now I just it's such a breath of fresh air to I, I always learn something from you and uh, it is always a, an honor to be around you and hear you speak. And, you know, for us in, in, in this culture here, oftentimes, you know, so tell us about stuff. What do you do? Well, let me tell you about the job that I do. And let me tell you about why I'm here. And, this, and you just offered a piece of your heart to us in that introduction. And I feel like I know you as a person so much better than well, my name is Peter, and here's my job, and here's what I'm doing today, and, and just like the bare bones of it. So thank you for giving us that insight. Thank you. Um, that being said, <laughs> what are you doing here, Peter? <laughs> so for me, 
it's about sharing my experience. And sometimes my experience might be what it's going to be. So I think about the reality of where I'm at today. And what something I believed for a period of time in my life, I really began to make changes right around the equinox of 1990. The spring equinox of 1990 is when I began to change my life. And at that time, what was asked of me is that I do what I can to be of maximum service to God and to the people above. That's what my life is about. To be of maximum service to God and to the people above. Well, what that means is really big. Okay? And what that means is that I sit or I stand in a place of love today. What that means is that I will offer myself to you as I am, not as I want you to see me, <laughs> because that might be a little different at times. I want you to hold me in a certain light, or I want you to see me in a certain light, and I want you to see me in spirit, and I will also show you my humanness. And I think that that's important for me to be able to be vulnerable in my humanness and show you exactly who I am, show you my pain, show you my struggles, show you my difficulties, and say that isn't what makes me who I am. What makes me who I am is how I'm willing to walk and I'm willing to take a different action. One of the things that I talk about, I have a podcast and I have another one that was just released within the last hour, so I have about three dozen of them out. And one of the things that I talk about is how I need to be able to treat you different than you treated me if you disrespected me. Okay? So you don't like who I am. You don't like me because of my ethnicity. My long hair would have been an issue not too long ago. Today, people don't make much of an issue of it. When I first began to change my life in 1990, there were people that were told to put their hair up under that hat if they wanted to keep a job the way it had been being done for a generation at a time. As a man, you're not supposed to wear long hair. Well, no matter how you treat me today, I will treat you with dignity and respect. If you disrespect me, and I disrespect you in return because I feel like I need to retaliate or my humanness comes out or whatever that might be, now I've just justified your behavior. I've said, well, you must be right because I'm going to treat you the same way. I can't live that way today. So what I'm doing is that I'm attempting to the best of my ability to be able to live different, to be able to treat you different to be able to show you love, no matter what it is you say to me, no matter what it is you do to me. Interesting, I'm at my place of employment recently, and uh, someone had asked something. I had a few bandages on my face. I've had some uh, surgeries done, and someone was implying, they're like, oh, did you get into a fight, or did you something and I said to them and I was very honest and I'm, I just really am very honest with people when they even though they may be joking somewhat our subconscious doesn't know we're kidding okay so I'm very cautious with sarcasm today and what I said is I haven't swung in another human being in decades I wouldn't do that you could swing at me, I would not swing at you. Okay? I'm just not that person. I'm not going to retaliate just because you treat me a certain way. So it that is more of the way that I live today. That is more of the essence of who I am. And so what it is I'm doing here is I'm trying to find a way to be able to continue to live that. Find a way today, when I say that I carry a good heart, I am saying it to myself, 
Okay, you might verbally hear me say, I carry a good heart today. I'm a good relative today. You might hear me say that. The reason I'm saying it is so that I can put it in my subconscious. What you get out of it, I don't know. What it means to you, I'm not sure. What it means to me, I know. That's why I say it. So sometimes, some of the things that I will convey to others are things that I need to hear. The things that I need to put into my subconscious. And the only way that I can do that sometimes is to say them verbally. Because I can say that mantra to myself, but that's not the same. It's different when I say it out loud. When we say for the first time what our truth is, who we are. Now all of a sudden we hear it differently. We've been telling ourselves that. We've been saying it as a mantra for years, maybe decades, the majority of our lives. But we haven't verbalized that. And once I'm able to verbalize my truth, my truth changes. And then I may verbalize it again to continue to put it into my subconscious. So what I'm doing here today is finding out what it is I can learn so I can live with a good heart and I can get a good job too. Thank you so much. Uh, you've already inspired me and taught me something a couple of times here this morning, so thank you for that. Um, you know, this, as I mentioned to uh, the crew here uh, initially, we've been in the middle of this series, this adult series on the modern face of immigration and migration and uh, taking different perspectives on what immigration and migration has looked like um, throughout time and still today. And uh, with you here, I'm wondering if you have any perspective or story around immigration or migration uh, that you might want to share. Uh, it is interesting because on the way here, I'm driving from the other side of the metro and I'm thinking about uh, sweat lodge that's just north of this building and how this land was Dakota land at one time and still is for some of us. And it wasn't Dakota land before that. <laughs> they took it from somebody else. So there are many tribal people that have been on this land for a long time. And I think that it's important that if we honor that, we honor that as tribal people. We're all descendants of tribal people. Everyone that walks the earth today is the descendant of tribal people. So if we can respect the tribal people that came before us, and we know that the Dakota were here because of our recent history over the last couple hundred years. And who was here before them? Who are the tribal people before them? How are they stewards of the land? You know, the migration story is interesting because I'll be at ceremony or I'll be at a celebration. The powwows are more celebration. The ceremonies are more sacred things that we do. And I'll hear people talk about, well, traditional, they'll talk about things like fry bread or, and, and it's interesting because it is traditional if you go back to the agencies and the way that the government rationed the lard and the flour, and therefore we got the fry bread. What is truly traditional? How did that migrate in? How did our food migrate in? What was our food before that? How did we live off of the land? How do we respect the land? Because it's the only way we survive. If we don't respect the land that we live on, and as tribal people from around the world, as all of us are, if we didn't respect the land that we live on, we didn't have food. We didn't have family. We didn't have anything if we didn't respect Mother Earth first. Because we weren't going to eat. We didn't have any food. We wouldn't have shelter without her. We wouldn't have anything. We wouldn't exist. So for me, that migration story is, is sometimes a little bigger and it might go a little deeper than just a generation or two. 
It's what are we doing today to keep the truth that's always been true. So if it's a truth, it's always been there. Whether that's a sense of love from one human being to another, as long as humans have existed, or our relationship to the earth and how we could only be able to tell a migration story today because someone before us respected the earth the way they did so we could have the food that we have so that we could have the shelter that we have so we could have everything that we have in our lives to me that's the true migration story is where is it that we came from I have ancestors from the island of Ireland my traditional Celtic name is Kato. It means of the woods. It was the name I was given at birth. I understand where it was that my family came from there. I understand how they were disrespected when they came to this land. I understand why they migrated with the Native Americans because they understood each other. There were the tribal people of Ireland. They were pushed out. The snakes were to be eradicated and the snakes were the Irish people. So that migration story sounds similar on different lands. And I want to be able to know that the truth is the same no matter who's telling it. No matter what your ethnicity is. No matter what your family heritage is. I believe the truth is always the same. And that, to me, is the beginning of the migration story, is how that truth is always the same. We always, we're walking the same. I have a friend of mine who's in another country right now, and he's going to spend a month of October in another country. And he was there recently, and he's going back to figure out if he's going to live there long term. He's getting to know some people. The truth is the same, whether you're in the Philippines or whether you're in the United States. The difference is today that we respect people a little differently than we do sometimes here. And things aren't that big of a deal. People are just who they are. And so how have we changed the migration story by the way that we've treated other people and not allowed people to migrate naturally to who they are? That would be more of a question that I need to ask myself. So I think that there's more questions about the migration story than there is answers today. Thank you. And as you spoke, I couldn't help but be struck as at the way that you speak about land and the island of Ireland and coming here to this land. I didn't hear you use the word country at all. Is there a reason that you didn't use that word? Because they are government bodies at that point. And I don't think that we as people should be dictated by government bodies. I think that we as people are free. And if we're truly part of God, then we're part of the earth. We're part of each other. And there's not a country that divides us. It's more that we are one. See, sometimes I think using certain terminology, they're words of division. <laughs> and if you believe in this country or that country or this or that, then you divide yourself from others. When it's just Turtle Island, the island of Ireland, the islands of the Philippines, a lot of islands in the Philippines, <laughs> a lot of islands over there. I'm not sure how many. A lot of them still speak tribal languages. So a friend of mine, she, he, so my friend who's traveling over there, he went to see another friend of ours who lives deep within the islands. And uh, they speak tribal languages still all over those islands. And to me, then that just shows a little bit of uniqueness to a person. It doesn't divide them. And what I like is the fact that you can point out the fact that I don't use the term country and it's not a conscious thing, it's a subconscious thing for me. 
That's just the way I'm going to speak. I don't necessarily consciously think about not using that terminology. It's just not part of where I'm at. My essence is in a different place. And I believe that what's important is that it's about one minute. It's about unity. And it's about people. And it's not about, I, I truly think that once you start to talk about country, then you get government and you get government in and then you get politics in. And none of those things really matter to me. They're not, they're, they're not going to dictate who I am today. Um, it's kind of like some people I've respected that who have been imprisoned in this lifetime, whether that's Leonard Peltier or whether that was Nelson Mandela or, you know, I mean, you can either be in a prison or not. If you've heard the way that Nelson spoke once he came out, um, the prison is either in the mind or it's not. And people within a country could live within a prison because of the way that they believe of their government or the way that they believe of politics or any of those things, or they could be free of those things. They could be in a jail cell and be in prison, or they could be in a jail cell and be free of those things. So I, I think that for me, it's more about the one And if I speak of a land, it's because I love the land. As one friend of mine said is, I love this land, I fear my government. <laughs> um, and he has a right to say that. I mean, it, it's like when I was speaking to, I have a biological brother who's two years older than I am, and I was speaking to him about some things that a man by the name of John Trudell had done. And uh, when he took a flag and burned it on the Capitol of the United States, and my brother said to me, he said, would anyone have more of a right to do that than John Trudell? His wife and his children and his mother-in-law were boarded up in their house and burned within 24 hours after he burned that flag. Now, personally, I'm under the impression that it was a governing body that did that. But the reality is either you're going to fall to that and sit and get worried about what this is, or I can be comfortable in what this is in this body and not worry about what that is out there. So my relationship to the land has to do with my relationship to people because we're all one. We come from her. <laughs> we are born of her in the sense that this is the only thing that we're going to live in and humans is on this planet. So until we return to the spirit world and we go home, this is what we have. So it's about my relationship to people as much as anything. Thank you. Um, we have we have we have still plenty of time left, um, but I want to take a moment and just touch in with the crowd here. Um, how is what Skeeter has been talking about and his, his messages and stories here. How how is this landing with y'all? Do you have any questions or um, yeah questions for Skeeter at this point? And I'll come back for another Q and A in a minute. But I just want to take a pause because Skeeter, you're dropping a lot of wisdom on us. <laughs> really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. And it's a it's a different paradigm than one that uh, many of us, and I would certainly say myself, um, understand this idea of um, recognizing the game of politics going on around you and being more concerned to higher understandings and connectivity with the land and with spirit than with sort of the games of humanity. Yeah. What you're saying, how can we enhance that into our public domain to make it more real? Because now it's nothing is being said as far as earlier elders or very little in their schools and their institutions and their social climate. Um. 
Did you get? I, I'm sorry, I missed the question. So, so what can we do to make sure that we are including the earlier generation? You got that? So, my question, my, uh, uh, the question was, what can we do for the earlier generation of elders? And my thought is, and especially as I am becoming an elder within my community, and we become elders in a couple of ways, the way that some of us see it is that Simple as turning 50 years old, you know, being elder. The chances are your life is probably at least half over at that point. So not a bad number. Few, okay. Now some people will live beyond, they won't be their life won't be half over yet. We know that. There's plenty of centenarians centenarians around. Um and what the other the other way to be able to become an elder, sometimes people become an elder before they're 50 because they become grandparents. And then I think about the fact that my daughters are in their 20s when they're having children, so they're already elders to their children, okay? And it's difficult sometimes as I'm looked at as an elder to try to tell people to respect an elder, okay? So what I need to be able to do personally is show my grandson the same respect I would show an elder in my community. Because when I show my grandson that respect, he will respect me. I will not demand it of him. So when I show my children that same respect that I'm going to show an elder, they respect me too. I don't demand it of them. And for me, it's more of that circle of creating that and giving that back to that generation that's younger than me and not ask them to respect me, and yet I receive that from them. If that answers your question a little bit. That sounds to me like you're talking about being a living witness. Right. That it's not about finding the right curriculum or uh, proposing an, a, a meaningful initiative, um, putting money towards an organization that's uplifting a message, but it's just living your life Correct. differently. Correct. Changing the perception. Because a lot of us have a misperception and we don't realize it. You know, I'm in this circle one time and I hear a guy talking about, uh, he's talking about maybe you need to make an inventory and he says something about his conduct is misconduct is what he was talking about and i said you need to look at your conduct because if you list, look at your misconduct you're going to miss a lot of misconduct over here because you're not going to realize it's misconduct you need to just list your conduct first and in that same sense i think sometimes we just need to look at the whole picture and not try to make it smaller we need to make it bigger in a sense You got another question? Yeah. Yeah. Backing up. I'm a very slow processor, so I'm probably back there. Um, you when you're talking about country and that being a So I, I so I'm hearing Mary the question being um, in regards to the, this this notion that um, countries are a human construct, this conception that we have created and we all live into. Um, or maybe not all of us. Uh, but it's certainly in the water that we drink and all the media that we consume, these constructs and these uh, social agreements that we've all made um, or have been given to us, how do we reflect on that and live differently? Is that? Yes, and maybe you have been working on that since 1990, right? <laughs> so what is some of your strategies for the brain? How you do it? <laughs> I do it here. Someone asked me one time what it is I believe in. And I think they were talking from a spiritual standpoint. And this was decades ago. And I looked at him and said, I only believe the truth today. It's that idea that I hold on to. Is that 
I'm going to think different than I did yesterday. I don't need to think the way I once did. I need to change this. And I need to start a new mantra. I definitely, that silent voice and the things that I tell myself needs to be able to be different. And I need to find the truth within that. So I need to be able to become one with spirit to be able to accomplish that also. I can't do it on my own because my humanness will confuse me. <laughs> because I will get either self-righteous or I, my egotism will get into it or something. Of my humanness will get in the way of it. So for me, it's more about being able to think of others, get out of what it is I think I need, or sometimes get out of what I think you need. Because <laughs> I think I know you know what you need. Oh, I'm talking about self righteous. You know, I mean, we you know we see someone homeless on the on the street corner and we think we know what they. Need. Really? Have you been out there flying a sign? Have you slept on a pillow made of concrete? I know what that feels like personally. I know what it's like this time of year to be sleeping on concrete, to not have a place to go, to be walking through the rain all day, to have the clothes on my back, and I have everything I own with me. I know what it feels like personally. So I want to be able to get out of those ideas that I think I know what somebody 35 years later feels like that's in that same situation because they're not in the situation I was in. They're in a different situation. I could act like I know where they're at because I've been in a similar place and I don't. That's pretty crazy. So any of you that think you understand where they're at and you've never even been close to that, can you really understand? Do you really know what they need? Do they maybe need? I, I understand, to my understanding anyway, I believe that we need love. I believe that we need to be respected. How do you respect someone like that? How do you love someone like that? Is to respect them, to allow them to be right where they're at. That's a tough one for some of us. We don't want to allow them to be right where they're at. It might be where they want to be. It might be where they need to be. But we think they need something different. We know what they need. I don't know if I do. So for me, it takes some work to be able to get there. And it's not a, a one thing. It's about thinking of, thinking of others with love, with a good heart, doing the best that I can for them, backing up, letting them have their own experience. It's their journey they're going to have. I can't create your journey for them. That's between them and spirit. That's my perception. You know, as wrong as it might be. I, I can't help but note a complete lack of need for control in what you speak of. There, I, you know, when we talk about um, what do we need to do, how do I live presently and be transformed, it's not like I need to transform myself and so I need to do these things in order to get to the goal that I want to be at. It's, I'm hearing a lot of a message of release, of release Control, control for where we have, where we think we have to go, what we think we have to do, and dedication instead to being transformed by being dedicated to love, respect, compassion. Yes, and you know it's interesting because I heard this tribal song about I release control. When you start talking about that, I love it. It's just so much voice I hear it. It's just elegant and it's, it's heartfelt. And I also go to a place where I realized that during the equinox of 1990, when I was either going to change my life, I was going to end up in prison for a long time or die. Those were the essential of the choices that were going to be made. 
And I was given an opportunity. And what I was told is that the person managing my life, the manager of my life was where the problem was. And I was the manager of my life. So I needed new management. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what it came down to. Because so it was time for new management. And that management needed to be a power greater than myself. It had to be that mystery. You may use different terminologies for that mystery. Sometimes that defines that spirit better than anything else for me. Because it is a mystery. That made a lot of sense. Um, I do see a couple of questions here. I got one, two, three. Oh, she's been sitting here. Okay. So we'll go one, two, three. Um, and just to note that this session, as uh, I'm sure most folks here were expecting talk of uh, migration and native migration and what that history has looked like. And we have been offered a gift on how we can work towards migrating our own consciousness towards a more holistic way of being. Thank you for that gift. I was just, um, I've heard a lot of discussion about the, the... So I think that through the years, a lot of people would say that certain things are lost. Tribal people of Ireland, I will use for an example, the Gaelic, the Druid, Celtic people, Sometimes people will say that their traditions were lost. We set them aside to protect them. We didn't lose them. We had to protect them, so we set them aside. Some of us will pick them up. As these elders return to the spirit world, one of the things I think of when you were asking your question is why we don't write things down. They're so often through time, they have been verbally, they have been storytelling, they have shared their wisdom, and now it's lost because they're gone. I don't believe it's lost. It may have been set aside in a different way. They shared their wisdom with us, and in doing it, we share the wisdom. Now, in the storytelling, the beauty that I like is that we fit it to be of maximum service today. So when I'm sharing a story, it's my truth with my journey along with what I learned from the elders. So the ones that are coming up today can relate to it because I'm making a person with my journey. If I told them of what my great grandfather's grandfather was doing, that would be lost on them. When he tried to make his way into New Orleans from the island of Ireland, his name was Mike, his wife's name was Mary. They were from the counties of Cork and Kerry. And they were my grandfather's great grandparents. So I could tell those stories. But when I speak to these young people today, they wouldn't understand the stories of Michael and Mary. So I tell them my story and my truth and relate it to the way that I heard it. And then it's something that they can pass on to their grandchildren. So I think that the story changes. I don't think that it gets lost. And it changes to fit to today's way of thinking, to today's society, to, you know, I, someone speaking of terminology earlier, speaking with a dear friend of mine, and he's, his wife is from China. And uh, so they're not, they're, they're lunar, they're uh, moving. Is their calendar and their way of thinking. And, and so, and also she would, anyway, when it comes to terminology, she was saying something and 
we this had come up because of my conversation with him, and she was misusing a pronoun for someone because they don't have pronouns in so much of the world that would identify someone as male or female. And here, our terminology hasn't caught up. <laughs> okay? And I say that because that's an easy example to use today. In so many ways, our terminology hasn't caught up yet. And that is what we're trying to do, is be able to give it to the next generation, even though their terminology will be different than the generation that came before me. Give them these stories so that they can carry them in a good way with a good heart and they can get it out. That makes a little bit of sense. Thank you, Becky. Your tribe saying they're not, uh, I'll get to the point. There are, in your bad past, past the Native American culture was that, when there's so much terrible. So the question is, um, with so many pains and disrespects, how do you come to a place where you have forgiveness and care in your heart? It's interesting, my first correlation, again, went back to the Irish, okay? The man that they refer to as St. Peter, who is not a saint. I mean, he was not ordained as a saint, ever. Uh, not St. Peter, I'm sorry, St. Saint, um, Saint Patrick. I'm confused. I didn't mean to say that. I missed you. Um, St. Patrick came in to eradicate the, saint, the, the snakes in Ireland. And how do the Irish people today celebrate St. Patrick's Day when he came in to do away with all the tribal people of Ireland? That's all he wanted to do was eradicate the island. Okay? And they consider St. Patrick a saint. So how do you forgive that? It's more about knowing what the truth is today in me. I'm not concerned with the way he mistreated people. I'm not concerned with the way that someone else mistreated my family whether that was here or there. What I'm concerned with is if I hold that against people today, it reminds me of a dear friend of mine. He's been to a couple of ceremonies here on this land, just north of this building where we have the ceremony grounds. He doesn't like to come here. He sees it as church property because he wants to hold on to what you're talking about. He doesn't like what was done of Christians to the natives. And what I tell his wife, she's First Nation from Canada. And as I share with his cousin, it's actually my daughter from Sisseton, I, I tell them that if we treat people different today, they will treat us different. If we want to hold that in our heart, we can't change anything. So we can't hold on to that. It's more about today than it is then. If I want to hold on to resentment, I got ones in this lifetime I can hold on to. I don't need to hold on to ones from way back then. And I don't need to hold on to the ones in this lifetime either. So in the same way that I don't want people to judge me for the things that I was doing in the 1980s, I don't want to judge people for what they were doing in the 1780s or the 1860s. I don't need to judge people for the past. And if I'm not going to judge or condemn them for their past, then that's my way of asking for forgiveness for the things that I've done. That's me personally, okay? I'm not saying that everyone can do that. I just don't want you to judge me on the things that I once did. That's my perception of it. Thank you. We got time probably for one more back here. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Scanlon, thank you very much for coming here today. Uh, my question regards, uh, I guess, immigration. Before 
the coda before the initial before the death coda. As I understand, there was the mound builders here, and that a long time ago. Is there any traditions? I guess a better word would be mantras that come from those ancient people through the Dakota, the Dakota, uh, you know, the I guess the people who settled here what three hundred years ago and less. Is, is there anything that transcends from those ancient people? Any knowledge and spirituality that, that we can gain from? So the question is um, from the ancient peoples who were here even before Lakota Dakota, um, are there still wisdom sayings or ancient knowledge that has been held and maybe told and reframed? I, I love that we talked about how um, that this truth that we hold on to, these stories that we tell, um, aren't necessarily now and forever will always be done this way. But is there anything that has seemed to persist? through those those eons? I believe that the truth has, and I believe that it has in spirit. Terminology is difficult because you're talking from one language to another, not just another dialect of it. And from my understanding, some of the mound builders in this area, I think of something we refer to as Mounds Park in the St. Paul region on the bluffs over the river. And I believe that those people that built those mountains were possibly found in what we know of today as Ohio by the time that white people got to Ohio. The Europeans came in and got to Ohio. Those people had to walk from here to what we know as Ohio. I'm sure it took generations for them to get there. And so do we still carry that same spirit? My perception is what we want to do is leave some spirit behind. And that spirit is the spirit of the unrest, the spirit of discomfort, the spirit of any of that we can leave behind and take the spirit that they carried in a good heart, that they carried as a good relative carry that spirit. Maybe that's what the Dakota Lakota learned that they're teaching us today that they've passed on through these generations and now we receive it today because our ancestors got it from them. I don't know that we know firsthand direct knowledge that it came from them. In the same sense that we know direct knowledge that came from the Israelites because it was written. Okay? So I think some of it is more spoken and handed down with a good heart so we receive from them, but we may not know where it came from, if that makes sense. That's kind of my perception of it, is that we carry it in spirit, and when we carry that good spirit on to the next generation, we can pass it on to the next generation what it was that we were gifted. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I love that sense that the truth is not just carried down through words and what gets written down, but the spirit carries truth through generations. Um, thank you for that. I, I want to check in with our online crowd because I know we got at least one or two or three. Um, anybody questions online? This is where they're unmuting themselves because they have a question. <laughs> and I don't hear any, so we're going to assume there aren't any. Um, we've got about five minutes left, sir, and I'm wondering if you'd like to have any last final thoughts, anything lingering. What what if you wanted to say today that you haven't said yet? And I'm recognizing that you're going to be speaking some more here in our worship service in about an hour. Well, significantly less. It's a half hour. The thing that I like is when you ask that question, there's nothing there. I will walk through my life to the best of my ability, saying what I need to say, doing what I need to do, and living the way I need to live. 
Upon waking, I ask the Creator to guide my thoughts, my words, and my actions. And I ask that I be of service to everyone I meet. That doesn't mean to be of service in my mind. It means I need to be of service to you and your mind. And what it means to you. I need to be an open vessel to be able to be there. I can't believe that I know you, so I just need to open my heart to you. When I walk into the convenience store when I'm leaving here, I need to be able to be a service to that person. When I go see the dentist next week, I need to be a service to the hygienist. I need to be of service to people. Doesn't mean that I think I need to bring God into their life because maybe that's not what they think they need. So how can I show them love, dignity, and respect? without me imposing my will upon them because I think I know what I mean, they mean. I understand that I just speak at times and I don't mean to. I understand that I suffer from a closed head injury. I understand that when I was three years old, my mother told me I spoke my first word. I worked with a speech therapist until I was almost 10. English did not come easy for me. Today, the podcast I do is audio. That's one of the points of right now in the podcast, is if you allow the things that are difficult for you to hinder you, you will not do what it is you need to do. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean you don't do it. Is it difficult for me to learn the Lakota language through the years? It is. Do I know a few words? Yes. Are they sacred to me? Yes. Can I lead songs? Not very well. Can I sing songs? Yeah, I can. I can sing along. You lead them out, I'll join right in. Because I can follow. To know where I'm at. To know my abilities and to take them to the, as far as I can is what's important. Take my abilities, take them to the edge, and stand there. Be present. Show up with a good heart. Carry a good heart. Be a good relative. That's all I need to do today. And not be selfish within that. Not carry egotism. To carry confidence without egotism. <laughs> oh, and that to me is not necessarily learned. It's just something I need to be able to walk towards, is that I can be able to be confident and know that I am a good person and not be egotistic about it. Now, uh, I know I said that was going to be the last thing, but I had one more good lingering question. <laughs> and it is uh, beautiful what, you're, what you speak of. And how then do you deal with you say that, you know, I, I don't disrespect others who disrespect me. I come into places with a kind of open heart. How then do you interact with people who seek to harm you? I say that I don't, and I think more so I need to understand that I attempt not to. Because I know that sometimes it renders in. It, it, for example, I, I'm on my motorcycle and I get cut off when I'm riding and someone takes the lane I'm in and I take another lane or I take the center lane. I have the option to either show you some sign language <laughs> or scream something at you or one that I found out really annoys people but I didn't do it for that reason is and I don't I didn't do it for that reason. Okay. What I learned to do when someone takes my money is to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To me, that's what it's about. Is being able, I don't need to get worked up. I don't need to be disrespectful. All I need to do is say thank you. And if I can say thank you in my heart, you may or may not hear it. And so it's not that I'm not going to be, my 
Sometimes my first thought isn't always the best. There was a time right around the equinox of 1990, first thought wrong, <laughs> definitely. Okay, not always today. Often today, first thought right. Sometimes first thought wrong. And that is where I need to go back in my heart. I need to just see it differently and see you for who you are, not for who you try to show me. Because who you try to show me, you cut me off, or you came at me a certain way, and your heart's a certain way today. I don't need to disrespect that. Is that me? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for being a living witness of a different way of living. It's a purely different way of living that is not within the binary of tit for tat and retaliatory action or receiving pain and giving pain, but it's just living with spirit in abundance. As always, it's been a beautiful inspiration. Thank you for being here. And thank, thank you, you for Thanks joining us that. later today. Um, and those of you who are interested, uh, I, I do want to plug at two o'clock today, we are hosting a watch party for the PCUSA in efforts to uh, heal and reconcile with Native peoples in Alaska recognizing the hurts that the church has done uh, to Native peoples in Alaska and seeking to live in a different way, to honor and recognize, not to fix, not to gloss over and be done, but to live together in relationship in a different way. That's today at 2 p.m. in our sanctuary. I hope you'll join us. Thank you again, Steve. Let's get to Thank it. Thank you.